I don't remember much about my childhood. Like, you know the stories uh, people have about growing up, running around the village, if you grew up in the village like me, I don't have that. I don't remember the good parts. I remember the bad. I remember everything bad that happened in my life. And I don't know why I don't remember the good. Maybe there was, <laughs> but I don't remember it. I remember being unwanted. I remember being a child that everyone had to tolerate. I remember being that child. Let me take you back to the 90s. <laughs> a child back in the village who lived in a beautiful house, but I never felt like home. I was my grandmother's child uh, because my mom had me when she was very young. So I became my grandmother's child. She loved me, like she, she really, really loved me. But everyone else around me hated me. And as a child, you tend to dwell on the people that don't want you. I wanted them to want me so bad. I wanted my aunties to love me because my aunties, I was never their favorite. They didn't love me, they didn't give me the attention, they didn't give me the love. I just felt unwanted. I grew up with my cousin and it felt like we grew up in different homes because she earned the love she had the intention, she had the gifts. They would bring up beautiful dresses that I wanted. And I wanted that, but I never got it. So what does Beth do? Uh, when I was, I think around seven years old, I learned how to live in my head. I learned that, uh, you know, when you don't get what you need in the real world, then maybe I can create that real world and a beautiful place in my head. So in my head, I was living in a beautiful home with my father that lived in the city that had money, lots of money. And this father wanted me. We had a beautiful life together, but it was just in my head. In reality, I was just this child in the village that everyone hated, who craved love so bad that she was willing to do just about anything to grab the attention of the aunties. Um, it never happened. When I was nine, I was raped at nine. And I didn't know much about sex. In the 90s, no one told you what sex was at nine years old. So I knew something bad had happened to me. But um, all I remember is something looking like pass in my panties. That's all I remember. There was pass in my, in my panties. And I never told anyone. Not because there was, actually there was no one to tell. Because if I told them, they would find reasons to not love me even more, because I wanted them to love me. So imagine me telling them something like that happened. So I continued being the perfect child on the outside. I continued doing the things that I thought would make everyone love me and accept me. And I wanted to be a perfect child for my grandma. You know why? Because she was the only one that was there for me. And for some reason, I thought if I wasn't the perfect child for my grandma, she would just one day up and just leave me. So I was very perfect. 
On the inside, though, I was crumbling. It felt like I was living a double life. So there was the life where on the outside, everyone thought she's a happy child. She's well behaved. She doesn't give us trouble. <laughs> but there was this rebellious person inside that wanted to come out. But there was no, I, I was not allowed to. I couldn't afford to, to be rebellious and all that. So um, a few months after my rape, I remember having this intense pain in my stomach. It was so intense that I could not hide it. Like I just kept thinking this is the time. Maybe I need to tell my grandma that I have a stomachache. And that's exactly what I did. I told my grandma I have a stomachache. And she takes me to this doctor who does all kinds of tests and gives me these tablets and says, please make sure you complete this dose. Reason, she said I have pus in my stomach. I've seen that before, right? There was pus in my panties and now there is pus in my stomach. So my little mind told me, I had these worms of, in my tummy that were eating at my walls. <laughs> That's why I have the pus in my stomach. Now I know I had an STD. So funny, I don't know what I was given, but in the duration of two weeks, I had pus coming out of my vagina for two weeks. For a nine-year-old, that is too much. And I still could not tell anyone. Why, how would I tell anyone that? I wanted them to love me, still. So I kept it to myself. I kept living in my head. I kept having this perfect world in my head. And I don't remember much about having any dreams because the life I was living was not mine. I didn't have any dreams. I never knew what I wanted to be or who I wanted to be when I grew up. I just knew I wanted to have money. I wanted to have money because um, I knew not having money is bad from my aunties who kept telling me how my mother was poor and she could not even afford to take care of me. They kept telling me I'll amount to nothing. I'll be like my mother. And <laughs> I knew I wanted them to, like, to get to a point where they don't talk ill of my mom. I wanted to get her to a place where, you know what? You're doing good. Like, your life is perfect. So I knew to do that and to go to school, get my good grades, get a job. I didn't know what job, whatever job as long as it had money. And I also wanted to pass because I thought, who doesn't love someone that has good grades? No one. So I knew if I passed my exams, maybe, finally, I'll get that love. <laughs> I got the good grades. I went to campus in Uganda, and it was amazing. It was supposed to be an amazing experience. I've heard people say campus is an amazing experience. I don't know which campuses you go to. <laughs> Mine would have been amazing, but I was still living in my head. I was still that scared child that knew if I made one mistake, my grandma would just leave me. And you know, uh, at some point I was told my grandmother's home is not your home. Where your mother is married is not your home. So I knew I had no home when I was very young. So I got my money, I got my good grants, I got amazing jobs, and I got the money. I got the millions that I was looking for. I made sure my mom was okay. I made sure my sisters went to school. And then my dream was achieved. So what else? 
who was I without those dreams of getting money and getting everyone to the place where they need to be? So I realized I was different at some point when I started going out with my friends and they would react so different to situations. And I would just be like numb. Like something would happen and everyone is crying and I'm just looking at you like, are you crazy? Why are you crying? You see, I never cried as a child. I can tell you the number of times I've cried as an adult. Why? Crying is a weakness that I could not afford when I was a child. So I took it to my adulthood. I still don't cry. I admire people that cry. That deep cry from the tummy or a deep laugh. I look at you and go like, oh my God, I wish I could do that. <laughs> so I started to notice small things about me that told me I was different. I, I, I wasn't happy. I had no idea what joy was or how to be happy. At least the definition of happiness that I saw in books and movies and with my friends because I never had that. I could never cry. And then it got to a point where after all the jobs and all the money, I started noticing that I hated everything that was around me. I stopped loving the movies. I stopped sleeping. I would wake up in the morning and all I want to do is just not get out of bed. And no hopes. I had no dreams. I had nothing. I was just a shell. I felt like I was just a robot going through life with nothing. And I felt like that for a long time. I would wake up in the morning and want to go straight back to bed because my mind just told me, just go back to bed. Why are you waking up? You have no dreams, you have nothing. So at some point, I started going to hospital and telling them there's something seriously wrong with me. But the doctors would go like, ah, no, there's nothing wrong with you. But at some point, I went to Google, where we all go, Dr. Google. And Dr. Google told me I have clinical depression and anxiety. And I was like, what is that? All we know, all I knew is the village people that are insane. That's it. About mental health, that's all I knew. So when I was told I have clinical depression and anxiety, I went online again, <laughs> because that's where we go, and Googled it. And finally, it made sense. I felt relief. I was relieved because you mean what I have has a name? You mean what I feel has a name? Anything that has a name can be cured, right? So I was very happy when I found a name for how I felt. And the next thing was going to see a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist indeed confirmed I was severely depressed. And the psychiatrist says, how have you been surviving? Do you work? Yes. Do you? Shower, like the most ridiculous question. Who asks you if you shower? I went like, yeah, I shower. So she says, I have been depressed since I was a child, four or five years old. And what was the next step? The next step was therapy. It was a lot of medicine. And... Through this journey, uh, I realized that treating mental health is not cheap. So what does Beth do? Beth has a good pay slip. She goes and gets all the loans she can. 
all the mobile apps, I know them by name. I got all the loans. I borrowed all the friends that I could because I wanted to be okay. So I spent my money on that and a lot of other bad decisions. I was okay when I was employed, but two, late, two years later, I was laid off. Why? I couldn't perform anymore. I'm in business development. I'm supposed to bring sales. I'm supposed to be this superwoman that makes it. So when I was laid off, it got so bad that I stayed home for, I stayed actually, I stayed in my house for over six months, maxing out on all my credit cards. It got so bad that I tried committing suicide, not once, not twice. For some reason, I think my grandma watches, like I could hear my grandma's voice, I don't know. I'm scared to let her down so I could die. How are you going to die? Just like that. So I always flush the pills down the toilet. It's not to say that I'm not going to try to do it again. I would because at some point it feels like death is like the only answer to the things you feel when you are depressed and you want to take the pain away. And the only way to take the pain away is not to exist anymore. So I stayed home, consulting, doing everything I could, all the side hustles for over three years. And I have been told so many lies about depression. I was told it's not an African disease. <laughs> they also told me it's a choice. Like who wakes up in the morning and says, I want to choose to, get, to be sick and depressed and all that. They also said, I can snap out of it. So for three years, I tried to snap out of it. I tried everything they said I should. I tried the yoga. I tried the running. I tried meditation. But then one thing no one considers is the fact that you have no energy. Depression literally takes away your energy. So I haven't snapped out of it. But three years later, I'm now back to work, full-time job. And it's not like I'm back to work because I'm healed. I'm back to work because I've accepted that I might have to live with depression for some time. We coexist. I look at depression like two people who live in the same body. It's a shandle. Sometimes this shandle just comes out and just decides I'm going to thrive and take over your life. Other times, I take over. So the things we're doing is um, we are learning what we both like. My depression loves sleep. Depression is lazy. My depression is hopeless. My depression has no dreams. My depression is fatigue. You wake up in the morning tired, I go to bed tired. I'm tired all the time. My depression just sucks. <laughs> but then, there are things that we both love. We both love money. We love money so much that we are willing to do everything we can to get out of debt. Because have you had those threatening calls from the credit bureaus when they call you and go like we are going to? It's like they want to take over your life. So we want those calls to stop. We want to stop owing friends. Not friends anymore because some of them got lost along the way. 
Because when you have depression, you kind of, people run away from you because they don't know what to tell you. They don't know what to do with you. Others just decide you don't have the money anymore, so you are not worthy of my time anymore, so they disappear. Depression also hates, sometimes hates being with people, so just kind of stays away from people. <laughs> so, what are we both doing? We are both doing everything we can because we love to travel as well. We want to travel and see the world. We both love makeup. We both love uh, making up our faces and dressing up and taking photos. Depression and I, that is. And we're going to do everything because we feel like our story is not over yet. And I'll tell you what I tell myself every day when I wake up. I tell myself that you are enough. I tell myself that if I'm not in this world, there are people that love me and there are people that are going to miss me. I tell myself that it's going to be okay. I tell myself that you'll get through this. And I tell myself that I am enough all the time. So I'll tell you the same thing. If you're going through a hard time, I'll try to tell you the same thing I do. My story is not over yet.